The Corporation by Yaron Brook. The Corporation. Corporations are under attack. Under attack in America, this, it seems almost as if there's a cycle with these things. Every 20 years or so, there is a renewed energy behind going after uh, business in America, particularly big business. And the fact is that in America, big business is structured as in a corporate form. And we'll see that the actual fact that big business is structured as a corporate form, the actual nature of a corporation is much of what brings about this attack. Um, if, you read, if you read the headlines these days, uh, you know, CEO pay is obviously a big one these days. CEOs attack constantly for how much money they make. And what is the story about CEO pay? The story is that CEOs somehow control these companies. They dominate their boards. The boards are just unthinking, you know, second-handed followers. Uh, and that everything that the CEO wants, he gets. And therefore, he negotiates the contract from a position of strength. The, the board just succumbs to whatever the CEO wants. And then, you know, 10 years later, maybe there's a shareholder uproar. Uh, you know, the board wakes up, oh, what have we done? We've given hundreds of millions of dollars to the CEO. And, and they have to fire him. Okay. And, and that's the story. And, and it's not challenged. I mean, one of the things we'll talk about is the fact that these issues are almost never challenged. Uh, you know, I'm a, I've been on CNBC a lot over the last year, and, and it's, it's almost always on one of the issues I'm, uh, that, that I'm a regular on is CEO pay. Why? Because if there's a CEO pay issue and somebody needs to defend CEOs, there is nobody. There just isn't anybody, so they call me. It's not like I'm, you know, at the forefront of this. It's just that the Ayn Rand Institute are the only people putting out material about this. Um, so, and there's an issue then, and there's, and in the academic literature, if you look at the academic literature, looking at CEO pay, there's a lot of back and forth. This is, and we'll get into this in more detail. There's a lot of back and forth on, is this an issue? Why is this an issue? How did this issue come about if it is an issue? And, and we'll see, we'll talk about some of that evolution. There's a big push right now, big push uh, for what's called corporate democracy. Corporate democracy. Uh, because we have these tyrants at the head of the corporations, right, we have what uh, many have called, including many people who claim to be uh, 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 defenders of capitalism, have called the imperial CEO. That's a term that has come about over the uh, last 10 years or so. Because we have an imperial CEO. Uh, these CEOs are obviously running their companies to their own benefit, enriching themselves uh, at the expense of, uh, of shareholders. What we need is more shareholder activism. And in general, there's this general discomfort about we've got all these millions of shareholders. Uh, they have no real control over this guy running the company. There's a real problem here. Uh, and how do we get the shareholders to have a say in running the company? And of course, the model they're using is a political model. Well, if all these shareholders, stakeholders, uh, all these participants uh, want to have a say, we should give them a say. We should give them a vote. And, and there's a real push, and you can see this in, in the last annual meetings at Walmart and at Exxon and, 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 and at hundreds of corporations, a real push by some investors to start letting shareholders vote on lots of things. And the ultimate, as we'll see, is to have shareholders basically manage the company. And, and we'll see where that, where the logic of that goes. Uh, so, we'll, yeah. um, it, you know, and, and we see that in Atlas Shrug, don't we? Where the logic of that goes when, when, when you have the employees voting on every decision. It, it's not going to be that much different if you have shareholders voting on every decision. Um, so you've got a big push on, on corporate democracy. But what's interesting about this push is it's, it's made in the name of property rights. It's made in the name of shareholder interest. Obviously, these managers aren't maximizing shareholder wealth enough. What we need is to get the shareholders whose wealth they're supposed to be maximizing more involved in the process so that we discipline managers to maximize their shareholders. But what's interesting is the same people advocating for corporate democracy, so supposedly the advocates for wealth maximizing behavior on the part of the managers, are exactly the same people who are pushing managers to be stakeholder friendly and to enhance their social responsibility. Exactly the same people. And we'll see who these people are and, and, and what, you know, part of what the, the both their ideological and their, their political agendas are. Uh, so they, they've got this conflict going on. On the one hand, they, they claim to be shareholder advocates. On the one, other hand, they're claiming shareholders should be only one group 
among many stakeholders. Who could be stakeholders? Right? You could have employees. Uh, you could have suppliers. You could have the community, whatever that, that is. You could have spotted owls. Uh, I mean, all of those are potentially stakeholders in a, in a sense that they are impacted by decisions made by, by the CEO. So there's this, there's this interesting conflict that these so-called shareholder activists have. On the one hand, going for wealth. On the other hand, going for its destruction, almost explicitly. So on the one hand, standing up for shareholders. On the other hand, saying, well, shareholders aren't that important. Um, and again, nobody, nobody calls them on this. It's, it's, it, nobody actually uh, makes a big issue of it. And of course, uh, over all this, we've got, uh, we've got a, a, an environment, a regulatory environment that is probably the most brutal regulatory environment that American big business, particularly big business, small business as well, but big business in particular, probably the worst regulatory environment big business has ever faced in the United States uh, in terms of their, their internal functioning. We've got a lot of activities that are being allowed to be deregulated. Uh, you know, things, you know, the airline industry was deregulated. Uh, the trucking industry is deregulated. To some extent, banks are being deregulated or at least re-regulated. The rules are being changed. But in terms of how the corporation functions internally, there's never been more regulations on, on American business as there are today. Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, which by one estimate that I saw is going to cost the U.S. economy north of $1.5 trillion. Dollars, that's with a T, uh, is the latest uh, of these regulations. But, but this is a trend from the 1930s on. And, and a lot of it not only has to do with the regulations in place, but a lot of the regulatory um, environment, the, 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 the burden placed on businessmen, has not only to do with the rules, but how they're enforced. There are periods in which the enforcement is lax, in which when interpreting certain rules, the interpretation tends to be more liberal, more open, letting businesses do more, and then the periods where the interpretations tend to be more stringent, more constrained, and we definitely have been over the last five, six, seven years in a very tight regulatory environment, and then add Sarbanes-Oxley onto that, and you've got enormous burdens uh, on, American, on American business. Uh, so that's kind of the world we face. And, and what's interesting is that the attack on business uh, at almost every level uh, comes from every quarter. I mean, there, there, is, there are no defenders, uh, uh, there are no significant defenders of business out there, and particularly when you talk about corporations. And we'll talk about why this animosity in particular to the corporate form. But um, uh, liberals obviously uh, attack corporations, and we'll talk quite a bit about, uh, about liberals uh, and their attack because I think they're the most consistent about the attack and, and uh, consistent about how they do it. Uh, in looking at, looking at this, uh, the, the attacks on corporations obviously go back you know, well into the 19th century. But in, I'd say in modern times, the most significant event uh, and the most significant advocate for attacking big business and corporations has been Ralph Nader. And I've been shocked in doing my research how influential Ralph Nader has been. Uh, the attacks that I see today in the newspapers, uh, for example, the issue of corporate democracy. The issue of corporate democracy was introduced by Ralph Nader in 1973. And in a book in 1970, he did two books, one in 73 and one in 76. It was actually discussed in Congress. Uh, he, wanted, he wanted national chartering. He wanted, he wanted a forced corporate democracy down the corporate throat, uh, if you will, um, all the way back in the 70s. And it's resurrected itself right now. And, and when you hear, when I hear a lot of these commentators talking on TV and talking about these issues and the shareholders activists, it, it's as if they've just read Ralph Nader's book. And it just shows how ideas, even bad ideas, or maybe primarily these days bad ideas, you know, just, just spread and have an impact on the culture in, in ways that you can't even imagine and they, where people don't even know the root of their ideas. I'm on a, on a talk show, regular talk, regular guest on this talk show uh, by uh, Tom Hartman. Tom Hartman is a, is a fire-breathing, leftist, anti-business. And, uh, and all his arguments, I've learned during, during this research, are all straight out of uh, Ralph Nader's book. Um, so the liberals hate business, they hate businessmen, uh, and they hate, they hate the corporate form, and we'll get into their arguments in detail. But what, what I find intriguing is that to a large extent, this is shared by conservatives uh, and libertarians. Um, some libertarians. 
I'll give you an example of, of uh, you know, a quote from uh, Irving Kristol, uh, a leading conservative thinker, uh, well-published, uh, very influential uh, among the neoconservatives, the, really the godfather of neoconservatism. Uh, and this is about corporations, about large corporations in America. Uh, quote, but one must also concede that both the founding fathers and Adam Smith would have been perplexed by the kind of capitalism we have in 1978. They could not have interpreted the domination of economic activity by large corporate bureaucracies as representing in any sense the working of a system of natural liberty. System of natural liberty, in quote, taken from uh, Adam Smith. Uh, the large publicly owned corporation of today which strives for immortality, corporations have, you know, the, 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 they, can, they can last forever, they don't have a sunset, which is committed to no line of business, but rather seeks the best return on investment, which is governed by an anonymous oligarchy, would have troubled and puzzled them, just as it troubles and puzzles us. And they would have asked themselves the same question we have been asking ourselves for almost a century now. Who owns this Levantian? Who governs it? And by what right? And according to what principle? He goes on, no other institution in American history not even slavery, has ever been so consistently unpopular as has the large corporation with the American public. It was controversial from the outset, and it has remained controversial to this day. This is from a leading conservative thinker. Take libertarians. The Libertarian Party's platform, to quote, it, uh, it also proposes to, quote, abolish the limited liability shield laws, uh, limited liability shield laws to make corporate offices and stockholders fully responsible for the corporation's actions. And then, uh, you know, in an in a article in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, uh, quote, first, the private right to free in corporation conflicts with conflicts with individualism inherent in liberalism. He means liberalism in the classical liberalism sense. Second, free private incorporation contravenes the basic liberal and common law principle of personal responsibility. Right. So, not only are they, um, you know, as, as you know, usual attacks on big business, they, you know, we, we, and I'm sure you've, you've heard objectivists talk about the attacks on big business, they attack the selfishness of the profit motive and so on. Here the attacks are, are of the corporate form itself. There's something wrong, inherently they're telling us, with corporations. They're, they're not responsible, uh, there's some kind of Levantian that the American people hate and yet, uh, and the funny fathers would despise. Adam Smith, indeed, as quoted, was not a big fan of corporations. So he wrote, he wrote negatively about the corporate form, but then again, Adam Smith wrote in 1776 when the corporation was a completely different entity than the corporation is today. Uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll see some of that history. So, you know, the, the, the question that we're going to try and answer in this class is, is why all these attacks? What is the nature, what is the, the more fundamental nature of these attacks? And, and is there anything to it? Is there, is there something wrong with, with the corporate form? Um, and, and we're going to go over kind of all their arguments and, and discuss them and, and see and, and, uh, uh, and deal with each one of them. And some of these arguments, just to give you a, kind of a, a, an overview, you know, they, as I said, they question the very legitimacy of the corporate form. Many, particularly on the libertarian side, and, and certainly the liberals and the, and the conservatives agree with this, um, claim that the corporation is, a, is the creation of the state. It's an arm of government. That, and that's the libertarian uh, attack on the corporation. It's an arm of government. It's a creation of the state. Uh, it couldn't come about in a true free market, and therefore it's a bad thing. Uh, the liberals say it's a creation of the state, absolutely, and therefore, well, what, what would the liberals say? If it's a creation of state, therefore, the state should regulate it, should control it, should dictate its actions. And the conservatives agree, basically, with the liberals, just they want to control it less. But they, but they don't question, there's very little questioning in the literature about the fact that the corporation is a creation of the state. Okay. And we'll talk about where that comes from and why. Um, the whole issue of social responsibility against comes from the same place. So if it's a creation of the state, then it has 
supposedly obligation. So for example, uh, what the state gives the corporation is its unique form. And in exchange, the corporation is supposed to function in a socially responsible way. It's supposed to give back to the state something. Okay, so there's this, and that's really where the whole idea of stakeholders and corporate social responsibility comes from. And then as we talk, there's this issue of separation of ownership and control, which, which is, a, I, I believe, probably the most sophisticated argument uh, and, and the one that has the most plausibility here uh, at all. We'll talk in great, uh, in great depth about that. Um, and of course, the, the whole idea of, of corporations not being uh, democratic enough. Now, let me state out right up front that uh, I think there are real issues. There are real issues. Not with the more fundamental questions that are being asked here, because I think those are bogus, but certainly, um, you know, there are some issues about corporate governance and about what's going on in corporate America. There, there certainly have been some big time uh, crises, right? I mean, we've got. Enron and WorldCom and uh, all, you know, a lot of real corrupt stuff has been going on. Bad stuff has happened. And I think we need to ask ourselves why. Now, I'll have a different answer than what they have, but I think that, you know, there is a legitimate question being asked in America today. Unfortunately, there are very few legitimate answers being given. Is, is what happened? What happened seven years ago, uh, you know, when, when, so many corporations did so many dumb, really, really stupid things. How, how could that happen? How could, how could CEOs get away with that? How did board of directors get away with it? How, how did the market not catch it? How did, how did boards of directors not catch it? How did shareholders not catch it? What happened? There was a breakdown. And once in a while, you hear about, a, a, even, a, even in this issue of COP, you hear about a situation with COP where you go, you know, that doesn't really make sense. What, what's going on? Well, what's happening here? So I do think there are some issues that we're going to have to uh, resolve and, and deal with. You know, I, I'm going to place the blame, as I said, in, in a different place than, uh, than, where, uh, than where, else, where other people have. Um, and I also, I think it's important to note right off the bat, that as a background to all of this, the background to all the accusations and all the problems and all the attempts to delegitimize the corporation, and, you know, these shareholder meetings that are getting rowdier and rowdier. If, if, again, if you've seen video of the Exxon annual meeting and the Walmart annual meeting, I mean, they, they, they're getting more and more aggressive. And, and, and a lot of, a lot of the, the bad stuff is getting passed. That is, a lot of the bad stuff a majority of shareholders are now voting for uh, in many businesses. In the background of all this, it, it, it's crucial to note just how well American corporations have done. Just how productive they've been. How phenomenally well the stockholders, these shareholder activists, have done. If you invested in the in, uh, in Dow Jones Industrial in 1982, anybody want to guess what multiple of your money you would have today in spite of the big collapse in 2000? Anybody know what the Dow Jones Industrial bottomed in 1982? What did it bottom at? What's that? 879. Uh, 879. I think it was something close to that. Uh, in the 800s. What's it at today? 13,500. 13, so the Dow Jones Industrial is 30 of the largest corporations in America. You know, that basket of 30 corporations has gone up in excess of 15 times. So $1,000, and, and I'm excluding dividends here, $1,000 invested back then would be $15,000 today. Okay. Uh, and if you go back to, go back to uh, stock market performance in the Great Depression, or go back to stock market performance even from the 50s or 60s, stock market, i.e., return to shareholders who are invested in our, what are called public corporations, has been phenomenal. Why? Why has it been phenomenal? Because these corporations have been incredibly productive. They've been incredibly profitable. They've made money, and all these shareholders scrambling these days and, and making a ruckus have made a fortune, have made a fortune. You know, the pension plans, the insurance companies, the, 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 the uh, uh, mutual funds, the, the, the people who invest in mutual funds have all done well, have all done well. And there is no question, in my mind at least, that the success of the American economy over the last 150 years is to a large extent 
brought about by the efficient, effective functioning of corporate America and the brilliance of the CEOs that have run those companies. <clears throat> so all these attacks are not, yes, we had a crisis in 2000, yes, 30 some odd companies went bankrupt, uh, you know, I don't know how many CEOs committed fraud, backdating options, stuff that shouldn't have happened. But put that in the context of the achievement of corporate America <clears throat> over the last 100, 150 years, even of the last five years, even of the last 25 years, 15 years, I mean, slice it any way you want. The achievements are, I mean, you could slice it in a way that was negative, but, you know, almost every slice you take, the achievements are phenomenal. Welcome to the Total Wireless Store, where total confidence awaits. I need a smartphone with an awesome camera. Got anything to fit a new dad's budget? Don't worry, you got this with Total Wireless. And now you can get $50 off on select phones $99 and up. My relatives won't miss a thing. Now you can focus on the important stuff, like diaper duty. Discover the Total Wireless Stores and get total confidence. The latest phones, the best network, all at great prices. Now open in L.A. Limited time offer in 63018. Available while supplies last. Porting required for a non-track phone brand. Offer only available at Total Wireless Stores. Visit store for details. How does that compare in the, in the worldwide context to how Europe and Japan have done? That's a good question. Uh, how does it compare to, uh, to other countries, how Europe and Japan have done? Because one of the things I find uh, is that a lot of these critics say, yeah, but in Japan they do it this way. And, and, and in the 1980s, particularly in the late 1980s, there was a big push to, you know, the kiwatsu, which is the Japanese form of corporation. That's the solution. That's the way we need to go because Japan is so much better than the United States. And these days they're talking about uh, corporate democracy. The, the, the Shareholders do a lot more in, in London, in, in, uh, in uh, the British markets, have a vote on a lot more things than they do here. So the big, big example is, look, in Britain they're way more advanced than we are. They're doing more of this. And, and the interesting fact is by far the U.S. market has, has beaten all these markets. Uh, Japan is, is a great example because Japan um, peaked. Uh, the, Nikkei, uh, the Nikkei average peaked at 45,000. For those of you who know where it is today, that, that'll be meaningful. Uh, in, uh, I think it was 1991, uh, the Nikkei is, the, is like the S&P 500 uh, in the U.S. Uh, the Nikkei today is, I haven't been following it, but I believe it's somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000. So uh, Japan, that Japanese economy has basically been in a depression, uh, certainly in a recession, uh, for the last 16 years, with some blips up and blips down, but basically has gone nowhere. And, and with a few exceptions of some phenomenal individual companies, corporate Japan has been a disaster. And indeed, the whole corporate governance structure of Japanese com companies uh, which it shares, for example, with Korea or very similar to Korea, has been shown to be very inefficient, very unproductive, and a, com and a complete disaster uh, for, for, the, uh, for the Japanese. So Japan has not done as well, and neither has, uh, neither has Europe, neither has Western Europe. Western Europe, I don't have the numbers, but Western Europe has done, uh, the stock market returns for stockholders have been a lot weaker uh, over most of the slices that you would take uh, than the U.S. I wouldn't exchange my S&P 500 uh, over this last 25 years with any other index. I mean, you might find some emerging market index that's done very well. Yeah. Don't you also have another variable in the sense that in the American market, we have as individual shareholders the percentage of corporations dramatically different from what we have in South America or Europe or things of that nature. So doesn't that variable also play in that a little bit? Absolutely. The, the variable, in, it, in, in what sense? Tell me in what sense. Well, the amount of the American public that invests in the stock market is a lot larger. A lot larger than yeah. the you have in other countries. Yes, and, 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 and that's, that's partially a characteristic of, of the fact that as regulated as we are, we're less regulated than, than they are in certain crucial aspects. But the funny thing is, and we'll talk about this, it, that's partially a feature of... Uh, some bad regulations we have in the United States, that, that regulations that restrict large stock ownership and, and diffuse ownership purposefully in the United States. So, so the regulatory scheme in the United States is set up so that lots of people own shares and not a few people own shares. It's, it's, it's actually preconditioned to that, and I believe that that causes a lot of the problems we have, is, is this idea that you can't have large owners like you do in other countries. You, you don't, we don't have the situation in the United States where the market will determine who owns what and how much of what. Mm. To a large extent, it's determined by regulation. 
Okay, so, but, but we'll talk about that. But yes, uh, you know, it's, it, the fact that these stock markets haven't done as well in these other countries might have hurt individual investors less uh, than if they, it, the ownership would have been dispersed. But I don't think the fact that ownership is dispersed has affected prices any differently because, because I think those markets are as efficient and sometimes as inefficient as, as the American market is. No, I don't think that's per year. The one I have trillion is kind of the, the present value of, few, of, of the costs over the life. And I think that's conservative. Um, and GDP is what? Um, 11 trillion. What's that? 11 trillion. 10 trillion. I don't think the GDP is 10 trillion. I, I'll, I'll look that up. Brian, do you know what the GDP is? It's like 11 trillion. 11 trillion. Okay, no, so it's 10%. Very good, Jason. <laughs> okay, so we have to remember the, the, the context of, uh, of where we're heading, um, you know, in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of how well, how well the corporate form, this form of, uh, that is being attacked constantly, uh, how well it's done, how well American business in this particular legal structure has done. Uh, and we'll talk about why, why that evolved. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what corporations are, what is unique about them, what is it that people don't like, why are they being attacked. So, so uh, what are corporations? Well, the, the particular type of business organization, right? So the particular type of business organization organized to engage in productive activity for the purpose of making money. And I'm, and I'm differentiating here between, you know, I know there are nonprofit corporations, uh, but I'm talk we're talking about you know, corporations as business, okay? What is it that makes corporations unique, let's say, and, and the obvious comparison would be uh, partnerships or self-proprietorships. So uh, if you go back to American history in the 19th century, many of the businesses uh, that were started were self-proprietorship, and as they grew, became partnerships. Uh, many of the so-called robber barons of, of the 19th century uh, ran partnerships, at least for much of their career. So what is the difference? What is it that makes corporations different than, uh, than partnerships? Real question. Limited liability. Okay, so one of, the, one, of the, one of the most distinctive characteristics is limited liability. What does that mean? It means that when you invest in a corporation, you're placing the capital you're placing at risk, the money you're placing at risk is that investment. If the company goes bankrupt, i.e., why do companies go bankrupt? They go bankrupt because they can't. Make money. Well, it's not really they can't make money. That, that's the cause. But what actually causes them to go bankrupt when they can't? They can't pay their debts. Well, they can't pay their debts. So they've got debts. They can't pay them. And that they're forced into bankruptcy as a consequence. So there's a gap between what the corporation has and the amount of debt. Right? So let's say the corporation has uh, assets worth $100 million, but the debt is $200 million. Those debt holders, if it was a partnership, could sue the partners, the actual individual partners who invested in the partnership, could sue them for that, different, for that extra $100 million, right? So the individual partners in a partnership are liable for the debts that the partnership takes on. Now, we'll see that that doesn't quite work in all partnerships that way, but that's the, the essential, simple partnership structure. That's how it works. All partners are liable for all the debts of the partnership. In a corporation, that's not true. In a corporation, if you're a stockholder, the company goes bankrupt, the value of stock goes theoretically to zero, but the, the debt holders cannot come after the rest of your money. Okay? They cannot uh, go after that extra $100 million. They can sell the assets of the company, they can recoup the, the 100 that's in those assets, the other $100 million is their loss. They lost it. Yeah. Is it only debt liability, or is it also like legal liability? We'll get to legal liability. Let me finish debt liability. Okay. Uh, so, seems like a problem because how do you? How, where does this limited liability supposedly come from? This is where we talk about state creation. Well, it's by, in a sense, this is how government supposedly has defined corporations. They have granted the corporation limited liability. Right? So when you, when you incorporate, 
you get from the government somehow grants you this ability not to pay your debts if you go bankrupt. Okay? That's how it's presented. And, and it's a huge, a lot of these quotes that we talked about, about escaping your personal responsibility and not living up to your responsibility, which, which the libertarians and, and even Crystal talk about and Nader talks about all the time, all about this idea that the government has granted you this ability to invest in stock, but not take on the full responsibility of that debt. So, so what, you know, could, could you imagine a situation where this could come about without the government granting? Could we contractually create a situation where we had limited liability vis-a-vis -vis our creditors. Well, sure, it would be easy. You would put it in every bond covenant, right? You would put in a saying, saying, and by the way, when you give me the money as, as a loan, you understand that you can only go after the assets of the corporation, you can't go after assets as individuals. And that would be contractual. And then the creditor would have a choice. What would be the choice? Either to loan you the money or not. And you might even observe in the market different rates, right? You might observe that a partnership and a corporation with exactly the same risk, the partnership might get a better rate. Why? Because they can go after not just the assets of the partnership, assuming the same size, same number of quantity of assets, and, and the same type of project, the same risk, You're assuming a lot of things, right? But you know, the partnership, they can go after the assets of the, of the partners as well as the corporations. So there's more assets, in a sense, to go after. So you might even see a lower risk and therefore a lower rate for this and that. But that, the market would sort that out. Right? What's happening now? What's, what's happening with, with corporations today? Well, all we've done is we've made this an implicit contract. That is, when you lend money to a corporate entity, and for example, one of the things the law requires is that you state that you're a corporation in your name. It has to be, um, what was it, uh, LTD or uh, INC. INC, right? And, and you have to say INC. Why? So that the world knows, your, your creditors knows that you have a limited liability. That when they lend you money, this is what they should expect. So all the law has done is codified a contractual thing that could have come about without, and indeed did, and indeed does, because even, in, even partnerships have limited liability. Anybody think of an example of a partnership having a limited liability? Most law firms. Most law firms, uh, most investment banks, and, and, and it all venture capital firms. So, for example, how, do, how does a venture capital firm work? Um, you have a general partnership, and they have unlimited liability, but then where do they raise their money from? They raise their money from what are called limited partners. And those limited partners have limited liability. And indeed, you have to register that with the state. Now, why would you have to register the limited partnership with the state? Why do you have to register a corporation with the state? To let the world know that it's limited liability. So there's no funny games. There's no shenanigans. Everybody who does business with you knows that there is limited liability. And indeed, the limited partnership, limited partnership form, this market creation of limited liability goes back to the Renaissance. You can find uh, uh, the Medicis and other bankers in the Renaissance creating limited liability. And they didn't call it that, and it wasn't quite the same legal structure, but something similar to limited liability structures in order to create limited liability. And why do we like limited liability? Well, what's good about it? You take risk. Yeah, it uses the risk of the funders, which makes what available? More capital. You get more capital. More people are willing to part with their money because the risk of loss is just the money they're parting with, not their whole entire net worth. So it, it makes available much larger pools of capital. Okay? So limited liability is a market solution. Formulized, recognized, identified by corporate law, but not created by corporate law. Okay. Let, me, let me ask uh, answer this. Other, oh, is this still about debtors? Yeah. Um, maybe, and, and isn't it the case that even with LLCs and inks, a, a debt, a, someone loaning money can require owners to personally sign where they're not comfortable taking that risk? Absolutely. You see that all the time in small corporations, you know, one man corporations or, 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 or a small business that incorporates. Um, I mean, at the Institute, I know, we're a corporation, right? Non for profit corporation. Uh, I have to, with a with, with credit card company, I'm the signator. That is, my personal wealth is at stake, uh, you know, signing, because they, they won't. You're right. 
They realize, particularly for not-for-profit, that the assets are limited and they want somebody else to sign off on it. So yes, even there, the creditors, when they want to, can circumvent the issue by, by requiring somebody to guarantee, you know, to guarantee your debt. Uh, so, so yes, the market, again, the market has solutions to these things. The market has evolved in particular ways to solve these issues. But you see, I mean, I, I'm not talking about quotes from libertarians from, you know, 100 years ago. I'm talking about this is now, writing about this. And to them, this is, and we'll talk about it a little bit why, but this is, this is still a, 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 somehow a state organization, the corporation, because it grants limited liability. And they can't imagine this, this market evolving. Thoughts? Was this what you going to... I was just going to say, so if you said limited liability increases risk, yes. it, 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 it would be more accurate to say actually it distributes the risk. Because now lenders are taking on a little more risk. Oh, yeah, it, 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 reduces, it reduces the risk to equity to the providers of capital on the equity side. It actually increases the risk to providers of capital on the debt side. So all limited liability does is redistribute risk. I mean, it doesn't make risk go away. It just redistributes it. But to the, the shareholders, it reduces risk. You know, and that's why they will need to provide the capital. And that's why we, you have large businesses with millions of shareholders. Imagine if you didn't have limited liability. Um, I would have to be concerned about the wealth of every other shareholder who owned the same company as I did. Because if I learned, turned out to be the richest shareholder, I, they'd come after all my assets, and indeed in a partnership. This is why partnerships, traditional partnerships, are structured in a way as that uh, you know, the partners control the addition of a partner very closely. They want to know who he is, his character, not just his character, his net worth. You know, it's, it's very, you know, when you form a partnership, you want to be very clear on who, who else is with you in that partnership. Okay. And again, partnerships have evolved to much more complex organizations than the, than the, than the simplified you know, partnership that, that kind of is imagined in corporate law. But, but in a simplified thing, every, every partner needs to, every partner can sign a check, every partner has a sponsor, every, every partner can make a decision for the partnership, and every partner's assets are at risk, and therefore the the wealth of your other partners is important. When you buy shares in the stock market, do you care how rich everybody else is? No, because they can't come after your personal assets. So it's not relevant, the wealth of the other participants. So it reduces your personal risk as a shareholder. But you're right, it doesn't reduce risk qua, sec, qua risk. Okay. Torts. Limited liability, the next, the next level in the limited liability argument is, well, you know, if I slip um, and sue the company for whatever, for all the damages because it was their banana or, 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 or it was, or, you know, these days it doesn't have to even be their banana. They, they, they just have to be the deep pocket in a radius of 100 miles um, uh, for me to sue them. And, um, and now, let's say I sue them for more uh, I, you know, my, my, uh, the court decide that I deserve more than the entire assets of the corporation, they can't go to the shareholders to get money to, to, to reimburse me. So there's no, they can't go after the shareholders themselves to pay me for, for, for the damages that I've supposedly caused. And you get this, you know, you don't get this obviously from Sylvia and Banana, but you get this, for example, from asbestos litigation. And, I, and let's put aside whether it's even legitimate and all of that. Here's the special litigation, thousands of people, they want gazillions of dollars, the courts are worth them gazillions of dollars, the companies go bankrupt because they can't pay it all, they liquidate, they pay it all, but there's still a whole lot of money that hasn't been paid. What a lot of these critics would love us to do is to go after the shareholders now. by any of the 133 Los Angeles area O'Reilly Auto Parts stores where you'll find everyday low prices on the parts you need to keep your vehicle at its best. Our guaranteed low prices ensure you're always getting our best deal. In fact, we'll match any auto parts store's price on any like item. O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Okay. Now, I am no lawyer, and I'm no specialist in corporate law, so this is my best understanding of, 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 of this issue. Uh, 
There is, there is a, an idea that goes back in common law to, to England uh, that, that if a servant does something um, and causes damage uh, to someone else, the, 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 the person whose servant he is is responsible for those losses. That is, he sent them on the errand and therefore you know, he takes responsibility for the servant's actions while he's on duty. Right? And the idea here is, Therefore, that, that uh, in torch you can sue the, the person who sent him. Okay. And therefore, the idea is so the, so the owner, if you will, of the business is responsible for the actions of his employees while they're employees. Okay. And so the idea here is the shareholders are the owners, and therefore you should be able to pierce the corporate veil, they call it, and go after the owners. But, but this is the difference. Uh, the reason... This came into, to, into common law in, 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 uh, in the first place. Is the idea that the owner controls the actions of his employees, is, is literally in control of those actions, um, and therefore is liable for those actions. But shareholders are not in control of those actions. Shareholders in a diffuse corporation are not... And if you just went by, by, by the law, they wouldn't have torch responsibility for the actions of uh, an employee of the company. Okay. Now, the board might, and indeed boards of directors have large insurance policies to cover that. The corporation is, and the corporations have huge liability insurance policies to cover these things. But the owner... The shareholder is not in control. Now, you could make an argument, and I'm open to this argument, and you know, I discussed this with some of the lawyers and, and, the, and the legal scholars in the room. You could make the argument that if you had blockholders who had control over the actions of the corporation, that, 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 you know, that controlled the board, that, that controlled the selection of the CEO, that controlled the actions, the major decisions of the corporation, you could make an argument that their assets might be at risk un, under, in tort. Okay? And I don't think that's a big deal because, again, that's what insurance is for. That's what liability insurance would be for, and they would just buy liability insurance. So that, I think that, that is, a, is a very technical. And the fact is that it's very rare that any kind of tort litigation is such that it would drive a a, a, a company into bankruptcy, and let me put it this way, I don't know if, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I can't think of a legitimate, legitimate litigation that would ever run a major, large corporate entity into bankruptcy. So I, I don't think the issue comes up uh, often, and it's certainly in a diffused corporation, I don't think it's a relevant issue, okay, because I don't think that the, the rules actually apply, yeah. Give us someone a good question. Sure. Uh, I still don't understand if uh, if three corporations for a second, if I loan you a gun and you commit a crime with it, I am able to do that. Whether or not I can control your action, I'm still the one who provided the mechanism by which you were able to do what you did. And in the same way, by providing capital to a business, um, I'm using them to, to take action. Whether or not I control those actions directly, I'm still I'm still enabling them to do that. Well, but it's not clear to me that if you, and again, I don't want to get into the legal technicalities of this. kind of things I hear, and I don't know really. Yeah, but I, I, if you sell me a gun and I commit a crime, I don't think you're responsible for my crime. Right? Now, but if you send me, a, a, if you tell me to go shoot somebody, or if, if, you're, if I'm doing it as part of you tell me to go and get money from X, and I happen to use a gun, and I'm on your employment, then you are somewhat responsible for, you are responsible for how I act under your employment. Okay? But just providing capital is not directing the action of the servant or of the employee. And that's, that's a distinction that's made way back in common law. Okay? And I think a legitimate distinction. It's to what extent you control the action. If you are completely separate from that action, then how can you be held responsible for what happened? And we'll edit it this because... What's that? If you knew, would it change anything? Like if I'm sure. going to shoot somebody... Shh, you absolutely, if you knew, it would change. If they, that's why I said if it was a block code, it would be different because you can't make the claim that millions of shareholders know every action that's being taken by every employee of a corporation. That would be ridiculous. Even in the, with a block holder, that would be a stretch unless it was some major uh, event. Um, but you certainly can't tell. So yes, if you knew it, it would make a difference. But I don't think you can make that claim with shareholders. Yeah. I think another problem is being able to control the 
prior partnership corporations made, including in, in the aspect of tax code. Yes, I, th I think that's absolutely right. <laughs> uh, that there is a difference, another difference between uh, sole proprietorship and a partnership and ultimately a corporation is, is in tax laws. And indeed, tax laws penalize corporations, right? And penalize associating with corporations, right? Because you're taxed twice. You're taxed once at the corporate level, once at the shareholder level. The dividend, you know, is taxed, both as income to the company and then when you get it as a shareholder as a dividend, right? So, so corporations have a huge disadvantage of tax in, in, in the context of tax law. So um, any other questions about limited liability? Is there a limit on criminal liability? It sounds like everything except so far as uh, civil issues. Again, I think the criminal liability would only apply for you. So if you were somehow in control and you knew, then yeah, it would be criminal liability. But if you, if you don't know and you haven't put anything in place that would necessitate, you know, the, the, the way you could expect criminal behavior, then no. Yeah. Well, actually following on that question, isn't the corporation considered its own entity? So if there's a criminal act by the corporation, it's the corporation that gets charged, not the officer? Yes, and this is the second big difference between partnerships, um, what? <laughs> between partnerships, sub-proprietorships, and corporations. Corporations are considered legal entities. Okay. But, but if it's criminal, you know, you, they're going to go after the people, you know, they're going to go after anybody in the, certainly the, the, the board members and the, and, the, and the managers, there's no question. So, uh, but, but let's, let's deal with this entity. There's this notion of, um, if it's a partnership, when you're signing a document, you're doing it in the name of the specific individuals who are partners. Goldman Sachs, let's say, when it was a partner, it had the names of the partners in its title, right? Goldman Sachs et al., you know, and the rest of them, right? So it was every time you signed a document, you were supposed to be signing it in the name of every one of those partners. Goldman Sachs qua partnership supposedly doesn't have a legal identity. So the assets that Goldman Sachs owned were owned by the partners. Corporations, as you know, it's interpreted at least, corporations are their own legal entity. Indeed, uh, you can find Supreme Court cases in which they're called a fictitious legal entity, a fictitious person. They give them, corporations have supposedly personhood. They have rights that are separate somehow from the rights of, of the owners. They are a completely separate legal entity, supposedly, from those, from the individuals that actually invested. And this is different. So the, the assets, for example, that a corporation owns are owned in the name of the corporation. The corporation, when sued, is sued qua corporation. When you sue a partnership, you are suing the partners. You're suing every one of the partners. Again, the critics say, well, you know, again, evidence of state creation, of this is an entity of the state. The state has granted this, uh, this ability to be a entity that doesn't exist in the marketplace. Okay. How, how could you do that? Okay. Now, of course, this again is, is ridiculous. Um, to the extent that it is a legal entity, it, it's a great convenience. It's primarily a great convenience for people to sue you, right, as a corporation. It's, it's, it's very convenient for the sewers because instead of suing five different partners or, in the case of a corporation, a million different shareholders, you get to sue one entity with known assets. It's much more convenient for them. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a market solution to the fact that you have so many providers of capital. It's efficiency. It's more convenient. It's just easier to deal with. That's all it is. And you can create such things with trusts, where you can create trusts that serve as, rep as that own assets, in a sense, in your name, that are separate from you, that, are, that act as legal entities. Okay. Corporations are not, and you see this everywhere, are not fictitious people. So where did corporations get rights, right? Property rights, for example. Corporations own stuff. Where do they get property rights? Are, they, are there special property rights out there for, 
corporations or, 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 or other types of rights that are corporation rights because corporations are now assumed to be this other entity. And, and indeed, there is discussion in the law about the fact that this, there are special rights for corporations and indeed lack of rights for corporations. For example, corporations do not have free speech. Right? You can't advertise whatever you want. There are all kinds of restrictions on, on commercial speech. Why? Because they're not, they're not individuals. The Constitution doesn't talk about corporations. That's, that's a different entity. It's a different legal entity. It's not individuals. It doesn't fall under individual rights. Um, so where, where, where legitimately would corporations get their rights from? Well, from the owners. Corporations have the rights of the owners. To the extent that the shareholders have rights, the corporation has rights. It's only an extension of the rights of the owners that give rise to the rights of a corporation. And the same with the other way around. Any right that the owner has, the corporation has. When you violate the right of a corporation, whose rights are you violating? The rights of the owners of the corporation, i.e. the shareholders. And the fact that they have limited liability or the fact that their ownership is a specific form, it's not the typical ownership of a physical asset, it's different, it's more of a contractual type ownership relationship, it doesn't make any difference. It's still true that they are the owners and that the rare rights flow through into the corporate entity. Okay? So, you know, the fact that they are their own legal entity is, is not an issue of state creation um, and then the third one is, uh, you know, partnerships end when a partner dies, when a partner leaves. Uh, again, there are all kinds of ways around this. Uh, Goldman Sachs has existed for hundreds, you know, for decades as a, as a, as a partnership. Uh, accounting firms existed for decades as partnership. So lots of ways around this. But again, the traditional partnership ends when a partner goes bankrupt, when he dies, when he leaves. You know, the partnership is those specific people identified as partners, and when one of them's out, the whole thing falls apart. Corporations, on the other hand, have indefinite life. The state has granted them indefinite life. They can exist forever. Stop by any of the 133 Los Angeles area O'Reilly Auto Parts stores where you'll find everyday low prices on the parts you need to keep your vehicle at its best. Our guaranteed low prices ensure you're always getting our best deal. In fact, we'll match any auto parts store's price on any like item. O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Again, this is a, 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 an irrelevant and, 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 and bogus claim. You can create that in a market setting. Uh, partnerships have. And it's, it's irrelevant. What difference does it make? Yeah. But these are kind of the, the kind of accusations, um, uh, accusations that are made uh, about it. And the last one is um, you know, this issue of uh, ownership and control. Uh, one of the things that make unique corporations is the idea that the owners, the dispersed shareholders, don't have direct control over the day-to-day -day actions that happen. Again, differentiate for partnership or self-proprietorship, where the owners run the business. The owners are the CEOs, if you will. The owners are the actual managers. But here we've separated the managers from, from the owners. The owners disperse, they have very little say, they have very little control. They appoint a board of directors to act in their behalf, who appoint a management team that supposedly does what they want. Right. Now, we'll talk a lot about this issue of ownership control, and I'll leave, that, I'll leave that to tomorrow. But let me just note again that this is not unique to corporations, uh, and this is truly a market I, I believe a market solution to a real problem. We'll get to that tomorrow. Uh, but partnerships have that all the time. They have managing partners who, who uh, they have, uh, again, the GPs and LPs and lots of other types of market solutions that have evolved in order to that create a similar situation where ownership is separate from control. Uh, why do you think that would be? Why, why would you want to separate ownership from control? What's the advantage, Amy? Yeah, some people have money to invest in, they're not good managers. I mean, this is, this is a wonderful uh, evolution of uh, division of labor. I mean, it's a great in market innovation, the separation of ownership control. 
The idea is that there is such a thing as being a good manager. There is such a thing as a profession of management. And that doesn't always coincide with the, having the capital. And what the separation of ownership control has allowed all of us is all of us can now be shareholders without having to be great managers. Okay? We can hire an expert. We can hire specialists. Just like we hire specialists to take care of our health care and our taxes and our legal issues, we now hire a specialist to run our company. Okay? And that's what they're complaining about. They're complaining about us hiring a specialist. That's what ownership, this issue of ownership and control boils down to. Okay? And yet, that's what Crystal was saying. Who runs these things? By what right? Who gave them the authority? You know, this is a big deal. Now, we'll see that there are, there are some legitimate issues that come out of the separation of ownership control, uh, but we'll see that they're mostly created by regulations, not by, by, by any kind of market phenomena. Now, we talked a little bit about this, but why did all this evolve? Why, why do we have these corporations? Why is this form so prevalent, popular? What if so many corporations? Why are they the biggest companies in the world today? Corporations. Yeah, it's what we just talked about, the division of labor. It's just efficient. It's an increase in efficiency. Much more capital can be accumulated. Then we hire specialized managers to manage that capital. And that is a much more productive form to do business than any other possible form. Indeed, those large partnerships that the so-called robber barons you know, started in the 19th century, almost all of them evolved into corporations as they grew. It was a much more efficient form of business. Particularly when the original entrepreneurs who were managers and owners wanted to retire or, or died, the, the solution to continuing to accumulate capital, to continue to grow and to bring in specialized management was the corporate form. And why can we accumulate large amounts of money? Because limited liability. Because Limited liability and separation of ownership control. Okay? So corporations are a market evolution. They are a solution to a problem. They're an increase in efficiency uh, for the problem of big business, for the problem of large accumulations of capital. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and, and we need to separate here between corporations and, and public corporations that, that actually issue shares out to public, because uh, I think all of them are going, to, are going to be, I would say all of them are corporations, uh, and most of them are public corporations, almost all of them are public corporations. Uh, now, there's a trend, which we'll talk about, to change that. Uh, you read about it all the time, uh, uh, which is called private equity. We just uh, Blackstone Group just uh, bought Hilton Hotels for gazillions of dollars uh, just uh, two days ago. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of these public corporations go private uh, and, uh, and kind of leave this area of you know, large numbers of shareholders and so on and, and take on a slightly different form. They're still corporations, but now they're private corporations versus public corporations. Uh, that's a, you know, but I still think that a majority, overwhelming majority of the top 100 are going to be public corporations. Maybe the entire top 100. I'd have to look into that. Yeah, I mean, even the largest of these private equity, the largest public, private corporation uh, is Coke Industries. Uh, and I don't think Coke Industries is, would, it, it's certainly not one of the top 20 in size, maybe not one of the top 100. And that's the largest in the U.S., um, and then you've got Cargill. Uh, Cargill, I think, is number two in terms of the top private companies. Somebody was starting to say something. The Hearst Corporation. Hearst? I don't think. No. Coke is my father. Okay. And, and this is not Coca-Cola. This is, this is a different Coke. With a K. What's that? K-O-C. K-O-C. That's right. Uh, they are the largest private, private company in, in the United States. Okay. So... In my view, corporations are an association of individuals. You know, they are ultimately individuals coming together for the purpose of a business. Okay. And uh, for the purpose of providing capital for business, this is not any different than a partnership. It's just legal form is slightly different, but in essence, in its essence, it, it is no different. It doesn't have any different in, in terms of the rights 
whites coming from the individuals, emanating from the individuals, the fact that this is a collection of individuals with a common goal. There's no fundamental difference here. It's just one is a more efficient legal structure than the other. A market created legal structure than the other. Yeah. So then you would disagree with the limitations on free speech? Absolutely. I think, I think corporations have, uh, have free speech. Uh, the individuals within the corporations have free speech, i.e. the CEO has free speech, the marketing department has free speech, and the owners have free speech. There's absolutely no basis by which you could limit corporate advertising uh, in, in a free market, in a, in a truly free, free country. Uh, are the existing restrictions on commercial speech actually tied to the nature of corporations as entities, or do they simply apply to even the commercial speech by, for example, uh, partnerships? <clears throat> I think they apply to partnerships as well. Uh, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not, certainly not an expert of free speech, uh, but uh, I would, I would suggest that that the corporate form. Uh, had some role to play in, in the kind of decisions that were made about these issues. Uh, a certain, again, uh, the idea that the rights don't flow and the idea that this is somehow a separate entity that, that, that owes the state something, that has some obligation towards the state. Yep. Can you just give me a quick example of the regulation that Amy wants to jump in. Yeah. There's this problem with the right? where people were making ads saying that Nike was hiring or, you know, for all kind of workers in third world countries and maybe child labor. You know, some attacks. They were actually publicizing attacks against Nike. And then Nike wasn't allowed to defend itself using the same media outlet that the attackers were. Yeah. Yeah, so there were restrictions on... I mean, the obvious one that came to mind is cigarettes or alcohol which you can't advertise, right? I mean, those are the most obvious, but, they, but they're more sophisticated ones where they can't actually defend themselves. Uh, and the standards by which they can defend themselves, the standard by which they can be smeared and defend themselves against smears are, are completely different than what they would be for individuals. Uh, is, that, is it the corporation in general or just the tobacco industry? It might be. It might be. Oh, it's, it's, it's tobacco industry, it's alcohol industry, but no, it's, it's businesses. Uh, I mean, the, the form in which, take the drug industry. Look at the kind of advertising the drug industry has to has to abide by. Is it because they're corporations? Or it's because they're businesses. Okay. Businesses. Because, because, because they're businesses. It, an individual proprietorship would would uh, be subject to the same rules, I think. I think that's true. But again, when they were initiated, I think it was it, it was corporations probably. Political speech. Yeah. So I mean, an attorney follows the rules. Well, you can't have the services as freely. Yeah, it definitely applies to the partnerships or proprietorship and so on. But I, I would suspect that the origins have a lot to do with uh, with the corporate with the corporate form. And you know, you could go back to the. I'm, again, I'm not a legal scholar. I'm not suggesting um, any other questions. Yeah. When does the corporation emerge as like a major? Okay, so we're, 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 just, we're just getting there. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Question on bankruptcy. Yeah. So uh, you see a lot today that companies file for like Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and the bankruptcy court reduces their debts, and they're able to continue operating. Is yeah. that legitimate? Can you comment on bankruptcy and how that works? Yeah, I'll comment, but this is tentative because I haven't really thought about this. And I'm, again, I'm, the bankruptcy is not an expertise. So there is a situation in the United States today which is different than other countries. Other countries function differently. In the past, you went to bankruptcy, you, you filed for bankruptcy, you basically liquidated your assets, you paid off your debtors, and the corporation was dissolved and it was gone. Uh, today, you have the ability to file Chapter 11, uh, which allows you uh, to, to, to go under, in a sense, court supervision, where you restructure, you pay off what you can, and you restructure and you come out as a different, corp as, as a new corporate entity, new shareholders, and so on. Um, and I'm, I have, I'm torn about this in, in this sense. There's no question in my mind that you could recreate that in a market setting and the market would probably provide for the same thing. So for example, I could write into my debt covenants the same kind of deal. I could say, if I, you know, I'm making this up, but if, if I go, if I can't pay my debts, you will give me a period of two years to restructure and we would, and, and you would take over control of the company, uh, you know, which is basically what happens in Chapter 11. The debt holders form a committee, and they take over the company. 
and they run the company under court supervision. And they are the ones who restructure them. And indeed, what happens is when the company comes out at the other side, who owns the stock? The people who owned the bonds, the creditors, previously. The, 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 you know, unless you're a bank and then you're not allowed to own stock and, you know, so with all the regulations. But, but put aside banks. If you've lent money to the company and they can't pay you back, in this reorganization, you now get equity coming out. And I think you could see... A, a, a market mechanism would do the same thing, and I think you would see it, because I don't think it is efficient from, a, from a, a market perspective to just liquidate and go away. I think it's much more efficient to hand over control to the debt holders, let them get the most out of the company that they can, and what would be the most out of the company in many cases would be to restructure it and continue operating as a new company. Now, whether Chapter 11 as structured today is the right way to do it, way above my pay, I have no idea. I just don't know. I, I suspect that it's got lots of bad stuff in it as well as good stuff. Um, so, so in, in, and I've seen, I've seen some bad stuff happen uh, under, under bankruptcy, under st Chapter 11 uh, supervision. But usually, you know, it's a law that was created by, 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 by this culture. I wouldn't expect it to be, to be any way close to what the market would, would do in a, in a truly free market. And I'm not sure you would have to have laws, but again, I'm not, I'm not. Maybe, again, you would have some standardized way of doing it. And that's what Chapter 11 tries to do, to standardize the process of bankruptcy. Japan, for example, until very recently, didn't have that. And, and, and it was a disaster. It was very difficult for them. For they, when a large corporation went bankrupt in Japan, they didn't know what to do because they had no formal process by which to deal with it. And it, it was very inefficient, very cumbersome. It slowed down the restructuring of the Japanese economy that it needed to go through over the last 20 years. Yeah. Uh, the argument overall is usually, well, this, the, the stuff in the cinema is, was an option, there is an option in the full market system. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is it important to consider whether the, the structure in law takes away options, such as, well, now you can't enter an agreement with a corporation that wouldn't allow them to, uh, to file Chapter 11. So that takes away the option of moving sure. in that sure. way. And I, that could be. I mean, again, I haven't thought enough about Chapter 11. But yes, certain, certain of these laws do restrict. Now, you could rewrite the law saying that uh, the creditor could write something different into the chapter. And maybe you can today. Again, I'm not an expert on the law. Maybe you could say, if you go bankrupt, you have to liquidate. And, and I can imagine a bond covenant that said that. So I, I don't think, I'm not sure that the law limits you today, but in a free market, it shouldn't limit you in terms of the options that you as a creditor would have. Okay, let's do a little bit um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the history here of a corporation. I'm not going to do a lot in terms of history. Um, how are we doing on time? 20 minutes. Thanks. Um, it, but I think, again, uh, this, is, this is related, the history is related to this notion of, is a corporation a state creation or is it a market creation? Because people use the history a lot to claim that it is a state creation. Okay. Um, so let's look, at, uh, let's look at some of this history uh, quickly. Um, let me just read you this quote uh, from, from Ralph Nader, because I think it captures this approach about state creation. Uh, Nader, quote, A corporate charter is in effect an agreement whereby a government gives corporate entity ex the entity existence, and that entity in return agrees to serve the public interest. And this, this, this is where the whole idea of corporate social responsibility comes from. Now, where does this come from? Because this is not completely out of the blue, you know, picked from out of nowhere. Uh, this has historical precedent. When, when is the idea, the concept of corporation first used? Well, it's first used in the late Middle Ages. It's first used uh, with the idea of incorporating cities, incorporating guilds, incorporating churches. And what did this incorporation mean? It meant that the king, who owned everything, everything was owned by the king, granted you the right to use a particular property under a corporate name for an indefinite period of time. So the first corporations were 
grants by the king, and they weren't business corporations, they had nothing to do, most of them had nothing to do with business. They were legal entities that were created in order to do something. Collect taxes was usually the case, right? And that's how they created these municipalities. The, 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 thing, that, the thing that unified a municipality is it had a one tax collection agency that then passed the, took a cut and passed the taxes on to the king. So that's kind of the original idea of, of the corporate entity. And it comes from this notion of the absoluteness of, of, of the king, the king owning everything. Uh, the king grants a concession. He grants you the right to do something with his property. Right? And indeed, this theory of the evolution of the corporation is called the concession theory of the corporation. It's all about the, the state represented by the king in those days, granting you the concession to act in a particular way. Uh, the first business corporations were the same thing. The first business corporations engaged in trade. Okay. Between England and, you know, the, the, actually the first business corporation was called the Muscovy Corporation, and it was set up in the 16th century to, tr uh, to facilitate trade between England and Russia. Didn't, didn't last very long, and they never made any money. Um, now, in what sense was the king involved? Well, if the Muscovy company was doing trade with Russia, that was taking something away from the king. Remember, this is mercantile economics. This is not a win-win type situation. The king wanted something for you to do this trade. He wanted something in return because you were doing something that is truly just the you know, you were using the king's property when you were trading. You were using the king's ships. Everything ultimately belongs to the king. So you were granted a concession to trade with Russia. And in exchange, you paid the king off, right? You bribed him. So there was this mutual, I give you the corporate charter, the ability to trade with Russia, the most famous of all these, uh, uh, these corporations was the West Indies Corporation, which at some point literally ruled India, uh, became a quasi-government that, that actually ruled India, but it facilitated trade between England and India. Um, and me, the king, I let you do that, right, because you don't have rights, we don't, don't have individual rights, I let you do that, and in exchange, you give me something, i.e., this, you know, public interest, right? You serve the public interest by giving the king something. Okay. And um, most of the, of the large businesses... Uh, going back, uh, were granted these concessions, and almost always these concessions uh, were associated with monopoly power. That is, you got the right to trade with India, but you got the exclusive right to trade with India. You were the only British company allowed to trade with India. You were the only British company allowed to trade with Virginia. That was the Virginia Company Corporation, another corporation, I think, that never made money. Uh, so, and then the, these people who got the concession from the king would then go out and raise capital, from uh, other people, you know, other, other people in, in England. They would create this corporation, you know, and some of them were very successful and made money. Uh, some of them didn't. Uh, this created all kinds of, you know, all kinds of shenanigans in addition. You had, you had bubbles, you know, the, 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 you had, you had uh, really bad business decisions. You had really bad regulations, really bad laws. And all the laws in England, until at least until the 19th century, really restricted your ability to create what we would call real corporations, free corporations. Um, everything had to be state-approved, state-chartered. Even in the United States, it's, it's really interesting, uh, and I encourage you to, to take uh, Eric Daniel's course on capitalism in America in the history, because it's, it's always fascinating to go back to the early part of the 19th century and look at kind of the economy and, and how it functioned and how how uncapitalist it often uncapitalist it often was. You know, we, we kind of idealized the 19th century, but there was a lot of bad stuff going on in the early 19th century. And indeed, the first corporate entities in um, in, in the colonies and later in in the states uh, were, were based on the, the same principle. Um, corporations, from the state's perspective, were viewed as a means to do quasi-state things like build canals. You, uh, you, ha you got uh, to, I, to be a corporate entity, and in exchange, you were given a, monop you were given a monopoly, 
and in exchange you went out and did something that the government wanted you to do, build a canal. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure in those days were built by these corporate entities. Okay. And it was clearly, there was monopoly, powers given to these businesses. Uh, you know, the, you, you could not go and just incorporate a business and start a business and, and go thrive in the very early part of the 19th century. Okay. There was clearly this quid pro quo. Now this all changed in 1836. Now, in 1836, uh, the state of Connecticut passed a new incorporation law, which basically said, just let us know you've done it. Okay? And you could do pretty much whatever you wanted. There was no monopoly associated with it. And it's very similar to the state incorporation laws today. Today, they're a little freer than they were back then. There was a whole evolution from 1836 through the 19th century of the states loosening up their control over corporate entities and, and, and allowing them, allowing any kind of corporate entity to come about, uh, and indeed in the competition, if you will, between the states in creating the most efficient corporate legal system, uh, laws of incorporation, and then a legal system that protected those corporations. Delaware, the state of Delaware won out, and indeed over 50% of all the S&P 500 companies today are incorporated in Delaware. And it's not just that they, you know, they have these very, they, they're supposed to have these very loose laws, it's it, and it's not even the state incorporation law anymore. It's really the Delaware over the decades it's built up a legal system and legal precedent where to some extent in the 80s they, they messed up quite a bit. But to, to a large extent it's very predictable what the law is going to be because they have this very long tradition of corporate law. So when you incorporate in Delaware and you can run the business from anywhere. You can incorporate in any state you want. If you incorporate in Delaware you get a set of established corporate laws that is predictable, or more predictable, put it that way, than any other state. Okay. So there was this competition on who could create that situation, which, which Delaware happened to win. Okay. Now, so it looks like the corporate entity indeed evolved out of state concession, out of a right granted. Okay. But indeed, it is the founding documents of this country that make that obviously ridiculous. Yes, the king violated individual rights for hundreds of years by forcing people to accept their view of corporate entities. And indeed, American states violated individual rights up until 1836 by granting monopolies and by forcing incorporation by their method. The 1836 law in Connecticut was the first to recognize what individual rights truly meant as applied to the corporate form and as applied to business. So the perversion is not the corporation today. It's not the existence of the corporate entity today. The perversion is what's happened before. The perversion is the origins, the original uh, creations of these, uh, of these corporations. Yeah. Is there something in, at that time in Connecticut that made I don't think so. I just I, generally, and, and again, Eric Daniels would know a lot more about this than I do. Um, um, John, uh, Andrew, <coughs> who's the president? Jackson. There's a whole movement in the United States in the 1830s, uh, very pro-free markets, uh, very anti-government regulation. Had to, it was associated with the Second National Bank, the renewed chart of the Second National Bank, which Johnson, uh, you know, was against. Now, again, even this movement is mixed if you look at it, because they're against big business and they're for small business and stuff like that. But they're clearly against government intervention in the economy. So it's, it's an ideological change. It wasn't a legal change. It was clearly ideological change of a rise of, of, of a significant number of people, uh, influential people, who believed in free markets, in getting in a separation between state and economics, and getting the state out of regulation. Uh, and it, it is a change pre-1836. Uh, in the first part of, of, uh, of the 19th century, you see a lot of government interference in the economy, and that changes after 1836. You know, that's the beginning of true free banking uh, in the United States. It goes on for, unfortunately, only about 30 years uh, through, the, through the Civil War and then continues somewhat until the, the, the early part of the 20th century. But, but that period right after 1836 uh, was, was, is considered 
uh, a revo you know, an economic revolution, if you will, where a lot of people inspired by Adam Smith and, and other economists come up and say, wait a minute, the state shouldn't be granting monopolies to build canals. You should let that, the market do this and, and, and things like that. Okay. So uh, the whole, the whole you know, attribution of this to some kind of historical, um, you know, historical beginnings is ludicrous. And it rejects basically the whole basis on which this country was founded, which is the basis of individual rights. This is new. This is different. Because for the first time in human history, a political system was established that recognizes the rights of individuals, that recognizes the fact that the state doesn't own everything and then grants you permission to use it, that individuals own everything and therefore can do whatever they want with what they own other than violate other people's rights, right? So history shows, in my view, the opposite of what is suggested by NADA and others. And not only that, but even during the times where states really restricted the formation of corporations and they were limited and they had a... Entrepreneurs were very creative and created entities that looked like corporations, legally looked like corporations, but weren't, weren't incorporated. So entrepreneurs were always looking, again, you, can, you could go all the way back to Renaissance Italy to find these kind of entities, but even in America, and certainly in Britain, these entities were being created in spite of the law that we created through contract. And all the 1836 law really, and this is one of the other reasons why it was passed, all the 1836 law did was recognize a market reality that already existed and try to formalize it and standardize it to make it, again, more efficient and easier. Again, the whole purpose of corporate law is that. It's to protect rights. It's to protect property rights. And it's to make things simpler and easier by creating a standardized contract that then you can change, right? The corporate charter can have different amendments and different changes, but at least there's one standard that when you have ink afterwards, everybody knows that it represents something. And then, of course, into the governor, into the covenants, or into the corporate charter, you can make changes to that standardized contract. But there's a standardized contract that everybody knows that INC stands for. That's the beginning point. It's not the end point. It's the beginning point. Uh, Britain uh, starts passing similar laws uh, 18, uh, in the 1840s and really passes the, the incorporation law that I think to a large extent still exists today in the 1860s. Uh, freeing up the creation of corporations, uh, freeing up uh, its own markets. I, I think, unfortunately, in Britain's case, it was probably a little too late for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and immediately after that, uh, starting in 1836 and really getting a head steam in the late 19th century, the corporate form really comes to dominate. So the corporate form comes to dominate through the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, and of course today, as we said, dominates business uh, dominates business across the United States and the world. You know. uh, in other countries, in France, Germany, Japan, um, the corporate form has taken different forms because of the different sets of regulations, the restrict or limited, but the basic underlying principles are the same. So you find corporations in all these countries, you find the largest business organizations in all these countries taking on the same form because it's efficiency, because it encourages and enhances productivity. So, just to sum up, corporations are under attack, and we'll keep seeing this. One of the most fundamental attacks that is launched against them by liberals, conservatives, and libertarians is the idea that they are state creations, and therefore owe a responsibility to the state in some form. This is complete nonsense. There's absolutely no basis for this. It, it, is, a, it, it is a denial of the existence of individual rights to claim that. Of course, that's never stopped liberals, conservatives, or libertarians um, before. Uh, all the characteristics of a corporation that supposedly the state grants them in the, this creation are characteristics that could be created and actually were throughout history created in a free market, in a market form. Uh, these are all relationships that could be recreated contractually. Okay? There's nothing special in that sense um, uh, with, with this corporate entity. And as we've seen, it is, it is incredibly productive. It's been incredibly successful. It is a dominant form. 
So the question now remains is, are there any issues? You know, is everything they say about corporate governance and CO pay, is it all nonsense? Is it all bogus? Is, is it just to be dismissed? And we'll, we'll pick up on that kind of trend uh, tomorrow and the day after. And I'll just open it up for questions now. I think I have a question over here. I'm just going to ask, should the progress go such that the government gets out of the picture entirely? Does it need to be managed and corporations just are going to be? No, I don't, I don't see a reason for that because I, I do think the law has a role to play in creating certain standards. I, I think that if the, if, the, if the government just went away, I, I, think, I don't think much would happen. I think it would be less efficient. I think, again, you could create these. But there is a certain value to having these, uh, this uh, body of law that that uh, based on certain legal principles that says this is how we deal with issues that come up when you're a corporation. This is how we deal with issues when they come up when you're a partnership. Because you know you still need a legal system under capitalism, right? So you need, and I think that you need some laws to anchor this. You need to standardize again these standardized contract, these standardized understandings. And I think that there is definitely a value. To incorporate, and remember, when you incorporate today, I don't know how many of you have, have incorporated. I've recently gone through that. When you incorporate, all you do is you write, you know you write up a bunch of there's a legal thing that your accountant gives you. You sign a form, you send it into the government, and they send you back a little diploma that you've incorporated. <laughs> they don't question what you've written there. They, I mean, it's not they don't put any burden on you. So, so in in terms of actual reality, the process of incorporation is just a process of registration. It's like registering a patent. And I think there's real value in registering the corporation. Because, again, letting the world know. Tom Bowden gave a whole course uh, where he talked a lot about the value of standards contracts back in 2001. Okay. And I recommend it for that room. Yeah. Well, I was going to make a similar comment that you know, when you're standardizing human relationships among you know, individuals, I mean, the same concept applies to like marriage and yeah. things like that. Yeah, there's a standard marriage contract. And the state doesn't create marriage because they have a standard marriage contract, right? It hasn't created marriage. It's just created a standardization. And, and, you know, people can ignore it and have different contracts. And they can live in, you know, in a, in a capitalist world. They can have three wives and four husbands and create some kind of legal entity. It's just not a marriage, but they can create some kind of legal relationship that binds those seven people together in some kind of other form. <laughs> you know, good luck to them is my view, but... Um, the fact that you have, let me, this last point on this, the fact that you have a standardized contract does not eliminate the opportunities to have other types of contracts that the market dictate one way or the other. Yeah, last question, yeah, I think. I was just going to ask, do companies in America, in America have a right to form a different kind of business entity that isn't exactly what, you know, what the government said the corporation is? Yeah. Well, they certainly can form a partnership or self proprietorship, and you don't have to register a partnership. You can, you can form a partnership, and the government doesn't have to know. I mean, the tax, for tax reasons, they do, but for non tax reasons, they don't have to know. So you can form other entities. Now, what kind of legal protections will you get? Again, you'd have to ask a lawyer. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, thank you all. I'll see you tomorrow. This course continues with lecture two. News 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 with lecture two. News.